Okay, good evening. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Concord Township Zoning Commission meeting for Tuesday, February 5th. Um, Typically simple agenda this evening. Um, basically, our, our first order of business is our most significant part of the agenda this evening, and that's a work ses session to discuss p potential zoning amendments. Um, we're looking at a couple things um, regarding dwellings, um, and I think with that, probably just let Heather start taking us through some of the materials she's prepared. units and those are currently only permitted in the R2 PUD. 
section. And then we have efficiency apartments, which I don't see anywhere that that's permitted. And then we have the live work units, which are relatively new that we had proposed to put that are currently a, a conditional use in the capital district that they develop under that um, innovative site plan development. Mm -hmm. But I know last year when we were looking at possible amendments, we were talking about eliminating those live work units from the innovative site PD due to the uncertainty of what would happen if the storefront closed and the person upstairs would technically not be able to live there. So, I don't know if that <laughs> rings a bell or not. And then the definition of townhouse, which is only a, 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 con a conditionally permitted use within the capital district if they develop under the ISP. So, in the other handout, I had provided you like the strike through changes, like the track changes, what I was proposing, like how to change these definitions. So the red would be deleted and then the blue underline would be new. Um, and I know this gets a little messy to look at. Um, so then it is nice to see what is actually going to change. Um, so I'm proposing that um, we consider eliminating the definition of apartment, um, cleaning up the definition of duplex and naming it um, family dwelling because it is really a building that consists of two individual dwelling units um, and then making a small change to, to the definition of dwelling um, to eliminate listing one family, two family, and multi-family dwellings but still excluding hotels and motels from that definition of dwelling. And then for what we currently term detached single family dwelling that we just call it a single family dwelling because it is clearly just one, one freestanding building with one dwelling unit only. And the definition <laughs> clearly defines that it is detached from any other dwelling in the space. So. And then for the detached single family cluster, the small house keeping it there. And then I'm proposing instead of having multifamily building and multifamily dwelling, we go away with the multifamily building and just define multifamily dwelling, um, which would be a building or portion thereof consisting of three or more dwelling units where the units are separated by party walls. And then we're going to eliminate with varying arrangement of entrances. I had put that in, but we um, do need to take that out so we're not changing what the definition would really so just the multifamily dwellings, those are clearly only in the R3. So like Lockwood, Bridge, that's an R3. Those are multifamily dwellings. Um, they, have, they do have private entrances for each unit. But then we also have like Concord Manor, where there are private entrances for each unit. And those were developed under this definition of multifamily dwellings. So, and those you go into the building, and then you might go down a hallway and, and then find the front door. And then I'm proposing some other changes to the attached single family dwelling. And as I mentioned, these are only permitted in the, the R2 plan unit development, which is basically, you only have one like, that's Quail Hollow in, Summer, in Summerwood. There's none in Summerwood. Um, there's only a, a, one small little development in Quail Hollow where there, where there are any of these, but pretty much everything in Quail Hollow is freestanding, detached your single family or cluster. And then I'm proposing that we eliminate the definition of efficiency apartment. Um, we should take out the live work units because those aren't really desirable uses that we want to see in the capital district. Um, and then tweaking the existing definition for the townhouse. So if those changes were accepted, you know, then you could potentially reorganize them in section five, renumbering everything, where then you would have a section of all the different dwelling type definitions easily accessible in one area of the zoning resolution. And that's what you would see on the, the third page of the, the other handout. And then it's also on the, on the PowerPoint presentation. Now these, um, we discussed these with legal, they haven't been blessed yet, and then it, we still have to go through the resolution to make sure that any other, all the, any other change that we were proposing 
on the terms, you know, follow through on the exceptions. You made the suggestions because you found developers were having a rough time uh, with the regulations. They found them confusing. Not confusing, but like um, it was a good opportunity to review what different dwelling types we allowed in Concord, and um, a lot of the other communities' codes. They are a little um, bit more user friendly, or even just the you know zoning officials or you know engineers, surveyors that are looking at your resolution to easily find all those dwelling type definitions in one area. Plus, we already knew that we wanted to take out the live work units, um, and it is better to put those density requirements within the, the section of the zoning resolution that pertains to, rather than the definition. Sometimes you can find discrepancies between the definition versus what's in the district requirement for that. Um, and then, in some cases, us. So, for example, if in the future, or even now, like if we wanted to define um, multifamily dwelling um, as basically as we take out, it's a building consisting of three or more dwelling units. So say in the R3 district, we wanted to allow them to have up to 20 units in a building, but maybe in the different districts, we only wanted them to have up to eight units in a building. Then you have that flexibility because it's not tied to the definition you can put that in the district regulations. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? Oh yes. Okay. What I, what defines the the party walls? Is that defined in a code too? Um, good question. I think you define it, but it's in essence the wall. I, yeah, between, wall between right. two individual dwelling units, but I believe we do have that. I brought my book because I need to see it. Yeah, it's in the, we do define that a common wall separating two dwelling units for at least 20% of its length. So, you might. And are only apartments in Concord, or is the Concord Manor, is it? No, there's, um, I'm familiar with all the... Oh, okay, the I just wonder. There. There. Yeah, there's other R3 developments um, in... That aren't defined as apartments, or they're well, just no, rentals? Well, no, I mean, they would have been developed under the multi-family yeah. multi building definition, okay. which would allow you to either they could have, you know, and I don't know what your definition of apartment is, some people define it differently, but like um, private entrances or like, or like go in the building with a hallway and have your, your entrances that way. Well, we're deleting the definition of apartment, I just mm -hmm. didn't. Well, because if you look at the definition, um, it's basically a dwelling unit because it says a room or a suite of rooms in a multi multiple family structure is a rain design used or intended to be used as a housekeeping unit for a single family. So that really, in essence, is the definition of a dwelling unit. So you're saying in that case it would be dwell, <coughs> the new application would be dwelling multifamily because that's, you're essentially right. saying the same it's thing. The same thing. So the old number 16 is the same as the 65. Well, the well, 65 was saying that here's the building, okay. and within this building there are between three and eight individual apartments or dwelling units. Yeah. So that's the way that they were tying it um, back when they were in the 70s, that you have this multifamily building, and within the building are these apartments, which are, in essence, the dwelling units. Um, but they but capped it, they're capping that, the definition then capped it off at eight, no more than eight mm -hmm. units. Right. So that, that presumably would have been where apartment came in, right? Because it would have carried on after that. If the definition sake, if you had something that had 12 units, what would you have called it per the old definitions? Apartment, right? No, I don't think it, it would not have been permitted. Just flat out, no permission, just based on definition alone. Right, because the definition said between three and eight units. That's For multifamily, but what I'm saying, if anything, if anything was higher than eight, would it, it wouldn't have fit in our zoning then? I'm Correct. Okay. Right. 
unless we've made amendments, you know, since then or before that. This wouldn't change any of the density requirements. We would keep all of that the same. Um, but what I would do is if, if we took out the multifamily dwelling, you know, if, if we got rid of apartment, it wouldn't make anything non conforming because we still have all the buildings were still developed under the multifamily dwelling definition that allowed up to three to eight units per building. Whether you had private entrances or whether you went in the building and went down a hallway and went to the front door. But we would, I would propose to just then put within the existing R3 section, section 15, what those density requirements would be if they were to, if they were to do a multifamily dwelling. A lot of people consider apartments as rental units. Right. I know when Quail Hollow was being provided, uh, developed, there was supposed to be a section for, quote, apartments. And nobody wanted apartments mm -hmm. in, in Quail Hollow. And to this day, there's no apartments. To my knowledge, and right. and it's interesting because in in the resolution, the only two residential permitted uses in the um, Bell Hollow is the single family mm -hmm. and then attached multifamily units. Right. And um, but then if you go to the parking table or the uh, at the end of the section, when you look at the parking requirements and the minimum square footage requirements, they they do list apartments. But yeah. apartment is not necessarily a permitted use. No. So this is another housekeeping where we can eliminate that. Um, and we'll just keep the attached single family units and then the, the detached single, you know, single family. Yes. Um, and then if you guys thought that we should look at other uses that maybe would be compatible with in there, then we can discuss it. I don't know. Do we want duplexes in, in a PUD? I'm not sure. All I know is apartments have a negative connotation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was like that a big time when they were developing Quail Hollow. Mm -hmm. They said, no, this is upscale. We don't want apartments. And that, that kind of conversation came up when we were talking about the town center. Yeah. People were worried, well, are people going to own them or right. rent them? Right. Or? Right. I think... You uh, can't really zone for that. No, you, <laughs> you can't. <know> that? <laughs> you can't, but I think people, when you talk about township center, if you're going to have like businesses downstairs, upstairs if you want, apartments are more acceptable. People seem to think, okay, we rent, rent over. It doesn't seem to be so objectionable. But you could also own that. No. It could be condominium. Well, that's true too. Yeah. But when you try to put it into a quote, an exclusive development like over here, right away it seems to have a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. That used to come up big time when we had public hearings. Oh, yeah. Way back when I was first on the board, so yeah. yeah. Most communities residents are sensitive. To Very, <laughs> yeah. They think that it's going to bring in some kind of different type of people, you know, that don't seem to care, or whatever. That's, that's what I mean—a negative thing about that, you know. Oh, people that rent like apartments—they don't really care, you know. They keep them up or whatever. There seems to be that negativity. Mm -hmm. I would always sense that from the public hearings we would have all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a ticklish topic. So if you're deleting the live work unit, mm -hmm. I mean, just say there's a business and then you were renting upstairs, that wouldn't be permitted? Right, because the, the way that our resolution currently lists it, um, it has to be like the, it's, it's like owner occupied. It's like the, the business, the, they have to go the, together. the work unit is accessible to the living unit. So it, it has to be owned and operated by the same person. Okay. Um, so we had talked about eliminating live work units within the capital district in the ISPD, but instead changing that to just dwelling units. 
rates that would be conditionally permitted above um, so business floor of a business and right home What's that? a business and then a home right and it could be owned and operated by different
um, they have less property owners there that are responsible to, to maintain it. But private streets really have allowed Concord to grow um, in ways that probably wouldn't have happened if, if every street had to be a public street. Um, but our zoning is very loose. We don't really touch upon it. So developers are kind of able to do almost like what they please, basically, um, over the years. Um, I did a little bit of research on what other communities allow as far as private streets. Um, most of most communities do really favor the public streets um, because they want to have they want to make sure that every lot owner has access to a public street, so they they can control that rather than private parties have. Some communities just straight out prohibit private streets, or they severely limit them, maybe only within planned unit developments or like a multifamily development, like our R3, um, or they list them as like a rarely used option within their communities. There are some communities that are being asked to take over private streets due to several issues of, like the property owner not being them, um, or they become a hazard, um, or they can, you know, safety forces can't um, reach the communities. Um, but I, don't, I know we have them everywhere. And there, I, I did provide you with a kind of like a pros and cons of private streets versus, or like what the pros might be, a developer can possibly initially save some development costs up front doing a private street versus a public street. They might be able to have more flexibility in their street design or, or their site design, being able to do a private street versus a public street. For the Concord, like for the community, there's no maintenance costs involved for us, you know, if, if they're private streets and we're still collecting, you know, property taxes from them um, that will need to be used to maintain those streets. And then even for a developer, they might be able to get a couple of extra lots or houses built if they do a private street versus a public street. Some of the cons uh, by allowing more private streets might be um, so those those lot owners are in essence paying double for their street. They're paying the community taxes for the services and then they're also paying for maintaining their own private street. I do hear that sometimes when people that live like over in Gabriel's Ed and Orient's Way that they don't necessarily realize what they bought into until after they bought it. Um, That's I guess amazing. Those conversations on the phone with them. <laughs> um, also, those lot owners then have to take on the management burdens so of the snow plowing and sewer maintenance repairs. And it could put in the long run, like long term, it could put you know the community um, in a negative position when they have to maybe force um, maintenance on those roads so they can have access to the people that like, live off those roads. And then there's the likelihood where subsequent house owners or lot owners um, might not be aware of all the liabilities that they've taken on by purchasing that house and all the maintenance responsibilities that they're going to have. And then there's the possibility that um, if we don't have some control over where those private streets are going to be located, that one might go in in an area that would potentially um, prohibit us from putting a, a public street through where we want uh, to see a connection, because you can't use private streets to connect public streets and have you know, public traffic going through those private developments. Couldn't we take it to eminent domain? Probably. I don't know. Yeah, but that, that's litigation, and that takes you know, oh, yeah, I understand that, but I think they have a good case that they're yeah. saying, you know, we need it because of maybe safety reasons mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, yeah. A lot of municipalities go through eminent domain to do, be able to do that. Then, I mean, that, I mean, I think that's like, that's a possibility that there's additional costs involved with all of that. Oh, true. Bringing the road back up to, you know, true. paying him on. Yeah. True. So those are just some of the things that are possible. Because when... When the engineer asked us, like, would you allow us to do this, I thought, well, now I'm, like, looking at how we regulate private streets. And I'm going to think, well, maybe if we, if we want to continue to allow private streets, then maybe we should have some regulations um, that would, you know, give the township some protection. 
I don't think that it's a good idea to allow private streets everywhere, like in all the new developments, like all the new subdivisions that come in, um, like Concord Bridge and Stone, Stone Ridge uh, Estates. Those are all subdivisions that are required to have frontage on a public street. I, th I think that's still the way to go, but maybe in, in cases like the planned unit development or the town center development, and even possibly the, the, the R3 multifamily type developments, um, it's something that we sh could explore to see if, um, if we want, want to allow that. Are you familiar with what other, I mean, just in, in along the lines of adding regulation or putting a level of accountability in there, what other communities, I mean, have you researched or seen what other people have put in as far as standards and what's involved in adding that to the code? Mm -hmm. um, I've looked a little bit, and I, well, as far as Lake County, um, I've talked to the Lake County Planning Director because just to get his input on it, because he's very familiar with the other townships in Lake County. Um, Hainesville Township, they do allow, um, they do allow lots to front on private streets. Their trustees have approved like their plan unit developments that allow that to happen. But when I look at their code, it's kind of silent on it, so I think it's just the way they're enforcing the resolution. <laughs> it does, they have the same definition of lot, which we have, which clearly states you have to have frontage on the public street. So it's not really addressed in their resolution. The, but the County Planning Commission subdivision regulations, they do allow for private streets and public streets if it, if it conforms to you know, the, township, the township zoning. But um, some, of the, some of the other communities that I looked at that do allow them within plan developments, they either have like a conditional use um, so there's that added level of review. The BZA could grant the, the conditional use permit, and they could stipulate you know, X, Y, and Z. Maybe it would be, um, I, I did include a couple um, on the last sheet of the handout. You, know, you could dictate, dictate a minimum width of the private street, which you currently don't have. You could require them to have a maintenance agreement be recorded, and that be um, part of the chain of title on all the lots that are served by the private development. That way, each lot owner and subsequent lot owner knows exactly what the maintenance schedules are and what the responsibilities are and what they're getting into. Um, you could require it that, that it be um, conveyed to the homeowners association um, and make sure that they have the right to levy assessments upon those lots. That way they always have the funds in order to maintain it. Um, and making sure that there's clearly um, access granted to emergency vehicles. To, to get back there. Um, we could require that the roads be constructed actually to the Lake County subdivision regulations. We could require them to provide a construction bond posted to the township um, to ensure that the private street is constructed in accordance with the county standards. Because right now they require them to build them the county standards. They, they make up the improvement plans, they submit them to the county engineer. The county engineer says yes, and they start building, but there's no inspection because it's all private and the county doesn't not care, but it's no going to be a private street, so they're not required to go inspect it. But we could require that they, that the developer have their own engineer provide us with documentation after to ensure that the, the road and all the infrastructure is built to the, you know, to the standard. And that would be a, a good safeguard in case in the future we were, you know, the residents that live on the private street did approach the township and say, hey, look, we just can't take care of this road anymore. Can we talk to you about maybe taking it over as a public street? Then you at least have some basis or foundation of, okay, well, we know how it was originally built. So it's a possibility, you know, it's just figuring out if it makes sense. Making sure that even just the street sign indicates that it's a private street. Helps people know that their street is private, and they're not going to call Frank and Service Department and say, you know, no one's coming, you know, plow my street. With, with respect to the <coughs> homeowners association, where you're I mean, kind of picking on the bullet here, the private sheets shall be conveyed to an HOA has the right to levy assessments, yada yada. So prior to where I live now, I was in an association, con townhomes, condominiums, whatever you want to call multi family dwelling units, four units per. Uh, anyway, it was private road, we had an assessment, and um, 
that group was part of one of the I can't think of who was that management company in Lake County that swindled like a cra- like a whole bunch of homeowners associations across like Lake and Geauga County and what made off with like millions of dollars and like all these home they played like a shell game with the funds and all these HOAs were like they lost all their money. I don't know if this is ORC or if it's just beyond your scope, but I seem to recall something in the conversation of how that went that there was like, and I don't know if it was my HOA specifically or if it was a, if it was state law that required a reserve because that was the thing is like they had assessment once in a while of like, hey, we've hit a threshold, we have to maintain a certain amount of reserve. And then, because um, I know at that time I lived there, we ended up a significant amount of money and so we were out of work redoing roads. Because they had got to the point a couple spots that after a few winters there was, it was they were pretty beat up from the plows and like multiple sections and scenes were cut up and redone and it was a substantial pro- project. So what I'm asking is I don't know if it's if it's ORC that requires that or if that was just a, that particular HOA decided hey we're going to put in a, a reserve requirement that sort of helps fund those infrastructures because you talked about sewer they had that as well mm-hmm. it, that occurred we had some breaks and those had to be repaired it was so very expensive so. I'm not sure if we could get in to stipulate it. I mean, if we can guide that or require it, or if that's something that's outside of our purview. Um, good question. I don't know that that's something that we can mandate. Um, I do know that, like, that the Lake County um, Sanitary Engineer Department, they do require a reserve because right. the sanitary lines are right. private. Right. So they require um, the developer to post like $50,000 into an account so the money is there. And if they have to make some repairs in the sanitary lines, they have the funds, and then they require it to be replenished. So they're always keeping that. Um, because, and I don't know how that was, if that's their policy or right. ORC, you know, I know okay. that they have to protect the standards okay. and stuff. So. Because their development was nice, and I think at some point everyone kind of complained, and they went in, and it was agreed upon that, you know, it's time to fix the road. But you could, I could see now how, if you couldn't get consensus or whatever, that the, you know, if it took a long time for a board to make a decision to repair the roads, they were in bad shape when they went, you know, and they were going quickly, yeah. you know, another winter and it would have been, I mean, again, not impassable or anything like that, but it would have been pretty bad. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about if we could, if we could put standards in to meet code requirements about maintenance. Can, just, can we go that far and stipulate, you know, I mean, I don't know how you define when does it become so bad that it has to be maintained? And that's our position to do on a private well, I think, road. Yeah, I think part of that is maybe just asking them to provide a, an outline of what their maintenance schedule is going to be. The developer needs to provide that to the, the subsequent lot owners. Like, this is what your road maintenance should be, whether it's like cracking and sealing and right. you know, all that maintenance that happens, the small maintenance things over the years that you do that. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking in most of these situations, this is too, when I'm thinking about the data. I mean, these roads were coming up, this is 15 plus year roads at the point where they were required maintenance. So you're gonna have a developer come in, they're gonna come for us, they're gonna have all this stuff, and there's gonna be a bunch of language that's set aside and approvals that aren't gonna come really come to bear unless there's like a like, you know, some bad settling problem and they gotta fix a spot. It, this is something that's gonna come up for 15 years. Right. You know, I mean, after several Northeast Ohio winters of heating and cooling and plowing and beating up and driving, they're gonna fall apart. So. The deterioration of the road is going to come down. When it's brand new, it's going to be fine. The problem is going to rear its head much later. Um, and who knows? What, and all that stuff, too. You talk about condominiums and whatever. I mean, you've got roofs, siding, landscaping, you know, trees that are 15 years old and trimmed. And all of those things all start to happen at the same time while most of the homeowners are lotty daddy paying their fees, right? And then all of a sudden the board goes, oh, geez, we have to fix the roads. We've got to trim the trees. we got to, you know, repair roofs and all that capital stuff comes at the same time and that ends up being the stuff that you hear about that homeowners and you know it's on realtors and we can't regulate them you realize this is all part of it and you know i bought my house they handed me a bunch of regulations i went okay put it in the file drawer didn't start looking at it until it became relevant you're still gonna have that problem so i don't know how we can so i'm just curious what we what what level of regulation we can go to it's a private road. It's a private road. Right. What do we care? So well, there's got to be. There's got to so be. If it's chip and tar, what difference is it? Well, make? there's got to be some <laughs> minimum, right, from a standpoint of passability and public safety. I would think there's something, right, that would stipulate. It's a private road. Well, I know it's not, that. It's not governed by our, you know, it's not. 
it's a private road. So, I mean, I'm... Well, you were saying for, like, fire trucks. For fire, I mean, they We've got to maintain some kind of standard, I would think, based on the law. Oh, width. Width But what about conditioning? What you, have you, have you driven down any of the, any of the... No, because they're private, trail, they have or? the sign that says you can't drive down their road, so no, I don't, but... Have you ever driven back there? No. You mean the ones next to us? Yeah. Yeah, no. Just take a ride down there. Okay. Try to run trail or, you know, the other one up above. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's crappy roads. Yeah. But it's a private road, so what's, what do we care? I mean, we don't, we're not responsible for shoveling it, plowing it, maintaining it, doing anything to it. That's, their, that's on them. I, I don't know that it's our job to educate consumers. Caveat emptor, right. you know, buyer beware. Make sure you know what you're getting into. That's what you said it's not our responsibility yeah, to like educate you. Said, you, you don't read all that. It, it, I, I agree, it isn't necessarily, but it doesn't stop people from being unaware of what they got into. Like I said, you know, I, I guess I go back to my original question because I was just curious of HOAs if there's anything requirement that they maintain reserves because I recall my board having one and they came to us and said, oh, we hit the reserve, you got an assessment, you got to start paying more until the reserve's pumped up. I don't think that's a worse. So there was a little bit more responsible board than some, probably, because they, they said we're going to maintain a capital reserve and mm -hmm. keep ahead right. of the game. Yeah. But the only reason why I was bringing this up tonight really was because the, de the developer and the engineer had asked if we would consider taking a look at changing the R3 so they could continue to do the multi family dwellings, which would be the, the buildings that have between three and eight units. But instead of doing it as a condominium development, they want to be able to carve out individual lots. So now these are attached units, so they wouldn't have any side yard setbacks. They would have a very small front and back setback, which right now we, we don't even have a front setback. I think they've been putting them like 20 feet from the edge of the private streets. So basically enough for two, park, two cars to park in the drive next to each other. And then we have, you know, no, no rear like setback from these hypothetical lot lines. Um, and we, if we wanted to allow them to do that, we would have to change the zoning um, to reflect that because right now the way our definition of lot is, it says it has to have frontage on a public street. I have seen some communities that have said it has to have frontage on a public street or an approved private street. And so then when looking a little bit more closely, okay, what is approved private street? And if you dive into their zoning codes a little bit more, the only areas where they're all, where they're even potentially approving these um, would be within a planned unit development or within a multifamily district. So not in your typical R1s so, and R4s, 6s and 8s, well, not everywhere, right. but in very limited circumstances. Which is what they're coming to you asking yeah, for. Yeah, that's what they're asking for. And that was Stephanie on the topic, Rand Rick and Wiles and Richard, she sat in on the meeting. Um, we've only, we didn't have very much conversation after that meeting. Um, talked to the engineer for the developer who, had, who was kind of like, hey, well, what do you think? What's the next steps? Um, I know that one of our trustees had said, well, let's, let's look at it a little bit. You know, does it make sense to do that? You know, maybe ask the commission. Um, I know that the engineer would be willing to come and talk to you guys if you want to hear him as far as what they're thinking or show you or um, if you thought you wanted to hear from them and the staff could look at it a little bit more closely and come back with more information on it. Um, it's kind of up, up to you guys. Is there a lot of these coming up within a township or just one area? Well, yeah. as you if you recall, like R3, you basically have to rezone in order to do a plan. Right. Um, there's two developments right now that are out there that aren't finished. This one in particular is um, on Hillshire Woods, mm -hmm. off of Spear Road, where basically it dead end, dead ends at the end of Spear and into 44 there, south of Lockwood. Oh. Um, on Spear Road. You know what I'm talking about? Spear okay. west of Auburn. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the specific development where they would like to be able to do the piece of the lots on the private streets. Well, could we maybe handle it just through the Zoning Board of Appeals, since it's just like a separate and isolated case? That is a possibility. Um, the only, I don't know that they'd be able to prove any kind of practical difficulty with complying. I don't know that it would necessarily be appropriate.
appropriate for the DZA to grant the tick variance because it would have to be granted for each individual dwelling unit. And we have to set and the it would guidelines. It be like them rewriting his own resolution. We so have it's better to. for this board to take a look at it and determine if it was something that we wanted to do. Yeah. Because yeah. we're the ones that set the guidelines. What's that? We're the ones that set the guidelines. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like if the DZA were approved, you know, 20 variances for that, it's in essence changing the zoning. Yeah. And since we've talked to other individuals, other developers that are kind of looking for the same thing, um, and what I was hearing even like in some other like county cities and townships, um, they're, they're also being asked to do that. Kansas Township, there was Riverview subdivision that's I think it's currently under construction. It's townhouses. They're attached, basically attached single family dwelling units that are calling townhouses that they park out individual lots mm -hmm. in front of private streets that's currently under construction. Um, then I know in um, the city of Willoughby, they recently um, amended their, their zoning um, to allow a developer basically to convert what is it already a condominium development into a fee simple type development. So they changed their zoning um, because they want to they wanted the community to continue to grow. So in order, they felt like in order for that development to finish, because it was, it's been sitting there unfinished for several years, um, and due to the developer not being able to get the financing, um, and the, the need of the, the city wanting to continue to grow and have new, you know, new homes, they felt it was appropriate in that case to change their zoning to allow them to do the townhouses on a piece of the from the private street. Um, they set it up as a conditional use so I have a copy of that, um, so I've, I've looked at that. And, uh, I, if it were going to be something that we would want to permit, I would like to take a look at it by the end of the day. So the biggest reason was because the banking wasn't allowing them to be able to finish developments. They couldn't get loans to do it. Right. I see. Yeah. And I don't know. Do we, do we care if you get a loan? I'm not sure. I'm like, is that a problem? I'm not really sure. <laughs> True. Yeah. Always something. Yes. <laughs> well, what did our trustees say? You say they were, they were there at this meeting. Um, Paul was there. Just Paul. Paul? was there, and um, he thought it was something that maybe we should take a look at. Because I, I do feel like this, this current administration does like to see the new growth and development that we have been experiencing. And mm -hmm. I know that there is a demand for um, lower maintenance properties. And this would permit additional lower maintenance properties because these individual um, dwelling unit owners would, would only be responsible for a small right. uh, land around them. Or they would even have like a common landscape or come and do all the, you know, all the individual lots, you know, depending on how they set it up. Right. So that would allow for lower maintenance housing to continue to develop. I know we have friends that live in Waterford that's off of, uh, you know, Met Manor Avenue, uh -huh. where uh, Target is behind there, and it's set up like that. Waterford. It's nice, yeah. yeah. They have some uh, two-story homes in there, but the most of them are all condos. But, but is, it's, is it's that a, considered private it's, street? It's like a well. It's yes, it is considered private street. Mm -hmm. But it's nicely kept up, and it's yeah, it's a nice. Spot. They, they as soon as they go up, one of them goes up for sale, it's sold like that. Yeah, and from what I hear, we're like, um, <clears throat> like the not adjacent to the Hunt Club, the, the multi-family there, the condos there, those those quickly. Yeah, yeah, right. As soon as they're up, you know, someone's there. Very desirable. Yeah. yeah. And they don't have all that big maintenance to take care of. They just mm -hmm. put in their flowers around the, their place, and that's it. Everything else is taken care of right. by the association. Landscapers take care of everything. Snow plowing, cutting grass. Everything. If a tree goes bad, they replace it. It's the only thing they have to worry about is their little plants mm -hmm. around the house. So. so I guess I would ask, like, if you thought that was something that were worthy of exploring, whether or not you would maybe want to hear from any other 
folks that you know. I'm, I, I guess I'm I, I'm interested in here a little bit more because I'm kind of trying to. <clears throat> Sounds simple, sounds reasonable, but I'm trying to trying to anticipate if there's a downside. I know. Or if there's something that I'm missing mm -hmm. in why I wouldn't want to do that. So I'd be open to some more research and information that might help get to that point. Okay. I agree. Me too. Sure. And that's, you know, I know that that's kind of what they were asking too, like, well, what are your concerns? That way we can figure out like how we could address them, <laughs> you know. So it's like I don't really know exactly what all the concerns are because it's it's the unintended con consequences that happen after we do it, and we realize. Oh, yeah, I want to. You know what I mean? I want to learn now, not by I'm paying out, uh, make the mistake first. Yeah. The find the, out. The, the thing that's pushing me is that you say we've got some developments that aren't finished because of this. So I'm, I'm intrigued to uh -huh. sort of want to see that we could. Help it along, but it seems sort of like, well, why? Why is the the lending issue? Is that, like you said, is that our purview? And what's the downside of doing this? Like, is there something that we're missing? Because it, uh, yeah, I, I would like to know some more before we really take that up seriously. Agreed. It's high up in the air. We're going to, the if it was, yeah, if it was maybe down ground level, it wouldn't be. A little bit of both. I'm not quite sure. I I felt like I noticed when that building went up. You know, and I recall in the presentation talking about the building height, but something that's not helping that bit of land is that Verizon store sits, sits high. higher yeah. than than wow. the Chipotle and for crowd crossing. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. up on a, a bit. So if it's at the threshold of the height limit. Yeah. It's got a 10 foot head start based on the property to the north uh, of it. Okay. So it's, even if it's at or under, it's going to look like, wow, that's really. Because I think the top of the unit, as soon as they built the building, I thought it looked high. And then I realized that that property is sitting quite a bit above now that Chipotle's a horizon. There probably isn't that much height disparity between the two buildings, but it's sitting up on that land it gives it quite a towering presence. And their sign, their one sign is very bright, the one that's been up. I think on it's the like, wall sign. Yeah, yeah, it's like. So now there's a, a pole sign, a freestanding sign, basically almost at the corner of Golden Cryo. That under our code, there's all these bonuses for a corner lot and, mm. you know, all this kind of stuff. So, Don't. again, there's a thing where you judge a deal diligence, you hired a consultant, you got it in place, and then you start administrating it. Exactly what we want. Isn't there somewhere in the zoning where it has to, a lot has to do with the line of sight from a, from the like from the road from the? It's out of the visibility area. It's it's twenty. Yeah, it it, it conforms with the location. It does conform. Yeah. Do now I got to go look at it. Yeah. 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 Guess how I'm driving. I'm going off tonight. There's gonna be a parade of cars all the time. I swear. The zoning commission's all going that way. Yeah, yeah, look. Gotta yeah, check it out, yes. But it does conform, and I yeah. thought they presented all that. I remember when they. I they drove down. I, we talked down, about I, went down well, I came up 44 on the way home today. I yeah, notice. I went down 44 and back up 44 when I had an appointment today. I didn't notice it. I didn't see. I didn't really notice it. went it. up today. 
I came home this today was, about 5.30. This 30. was like lunchtime I was out. So it's probably back around noonish. One one thirty, I think I was back, you know, through the area. I didn't see anything that like jumped out at me. Probably now being dark, it'd probably really stick out then. I, remember, I assume it's illuminated. So going when it's dark, you probably wow. really yeah, stand out. Really How many square feet? One hundred twenty. So it's so like twelve. Uh, Yeah, when they, when they came for site plan review, they had indicated to staff that they were going to do a full sign in, um, in the staff report and to the project that they developed. Right? Highly encouraged and told them that the administration would not really favor that, but we would rather like to see more of a monument sign of allocation. Um, they, they clearly had already had that in their mind. And since they knew it was allowable, they figured, hey, we're going to do what we want since we're complying. Yeah. So we have to go back and say, maybe, please, please, could you <laughs> try to work? There's a, there's a couple other things already in the sign code that I know I brought up to you before that we need to address anyway. More in relationship to the temporary signs and making sure that we're being content neutral and not talking about what the sign says, what the message of the sign is, and regulating it differently. Yeah. Rather just sticking with time, place, and size. Yeah. Which, you know, that's one of the things, not as you have to really keep your heads up on because with the technology changing day to day about what can be done, how things can be manufactured, built, and shown, you know, to try to keep it in line with if you're trying to create, like we want to say, Concourse like a bedroom community, stuff like that can really, with the new technology, what they can do today, especially when everything is the bazaars, mm -hmm. everything has to be in your face, mm -hmm. and if they can do it within the confines and really, you know, hit you, it can be kind of disrupting. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised Auburn Career Center, remember me on that big. Discussion yeah, they, on their they signs, have, and they don't have all their signage. They started to put up yeah. a couple of their. They did some temporary things too. Yeah, they they and they yeah. put up like three of the four, you know, as you're coming into the their different access points. I they, saw they put those. up some of the small signs. Um, they I guess look pink. They look they're faded. not the red and. Yeah, they're, I was not very loud by how they really turned out. Um, we've been in conversations with their design <laughs> team on. Their, their electronic message center and that we decided one that they were going to do. At the corner. Yeah. Cool. I've been they waiting for that out. one just to see how that I know they had it staked out. out and they still owed us some, you know, shop drawings of those signs and so we're waiting for those. So those shouldn't go up yet. Plus they haven't received their building permits yet. Make sure they get those as well so their <coughs> foundations are being checked and <laughs> yeah. they're not going to fall over. So we'll just continue playing around with yeah. stuff like this? I'll just can, I'll chunk away at this and um, okay. try to come back with some more, some more definitive answers. And, Good. Is yeah. anything anything progressing with the grocery store? Um, no, they're, they're, the owners of the property are still trying to work through their, their issues with their lender. Together. The home to suites um, have kind of been in contact with their engineer. Um, they did submit their traffic impact study to Lake County 
but I haven't seen any revised site plans to, to try to show compliance with all the conditions that we originally had given them. Um, so, very slow. <coughs> I'm surprised at how slow Holiday Inn. What's that? I'm surprised at how slow Holiday Inn. They didn't build very quickly either. It's about a year. Okay, That's thank you, Heather. Good, good work here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, next uh, agenda item would be the approval of the minutes from our January 8th to 9th, 2019 meeting. Accept the motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I so move that we accept the minutes as written. And a second. I second that. All in favor, uh, approving the minutes from January 8th, 2019. Aye. 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 Any? Okay, the motion carries. Um, audience participation. Oh, I'm sorry. Next is correspondence of the Zoning Commission. Frank? Mr. Chairman, I have nothing. Andy? Nope. Um, nothing. Sue? No. Nope. I had two. Oh, I was asked no. about the grocery store, and I received an email from somebody asking me if Concord was pursuing a post office. I said no, but we were making efforts to get a zip code and directed them to a trustee. <laughs> now the audience participation. There is no audience. Yeah, no yeah. way. <laughs> Come it's on. It's amazing how when we put this on there some time ago, so we could have, on. there hasn't been anyone that's been here since, since we made it part of our agenda that's ever been here. The level of criticism that we got prior to that because we didn't yes. have that on the agenda was absurd. Yes. And we put it on, yes. and there hasn't been anyone that showed up since then. Since then. So it just goes to show you sometimes the 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 outrage is somewhat feigned. Yes. Fake news. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The uh, the next meeting then would be March Tuesday, March fifth, uh, two thousand nineteen. Um, and with that, we will adjourn this meeting tonight. Okay.